You guys can hear me now, right? Cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you all for the introduction. I'm Ankur and I'm really excited to be here. Um, as I said, first speaker, a little hard to actually give up to expectations here, right? So, um, I began traveling when I was 12 years old and I haven't stopped till date. I'm 24 years old. Just a correction, I've been to 51 countries, 400 plus cities in India. And travel continues to inspire me yet and today. Now, just to understand, right, when we talk about travel and tourism, it's one of the biggest industries out there. 2016, uh, the contribution that tourism had into the global economy was at a staggering 7.6 trillion US dollars. Uh, if you talk about absolute numbers, it's about 1.2 billion international arrivals in 2016. Yeah. So if you compare that with 1996, say 20 years, it was somewhere around 515 million. So you can actually see the steep growth happening there. And you can say, or in other words, experts say, right, that this number is set to double in the next 10 years. Now, why is travel important? It's Apart from the fact that it's one of the biggest industries, travel is a really, really important part of any economy that we talk about. In some countries, it's among the most important industry, be it about uh, increasing uh, jobs or be it about attracting partnerships or investments in terms of education, healthcare, so on and so forth. Travel plays an important role. Let's try and keep it a bit right, right? Before I move ahead, give me a show of hands. How many of you like traveling? I know it's a stupid question, but let's just do it. How many of you like traveling? Thank you. It's just to keep it a bit light because it's like I see a lot of faces. It takes a little time for me to get into it. Uh, okay, so coming back to it, right? So travel has changed a lot over time, and it has gone from this. This is probably in the 50s and 60s when travel used to be. Uh, an adventurous body when you actually would tread uncharted waters. Not technically uncharted, but let's just put it that way. It was a luxury back then, and every single travel that you would go to was a unique experience. But that has changed. Today we live in the age of Airbnb, Booking.com, so on and so forth. There's make measure. There's so many companies out there. There's information right at your fingertips. Travel is no longer a luxury person. We have turned it into a mass market community. Which typically means big business, and when I talk about big business, it's 7.6 billion or trillion dollars worth in the last year. Let's put it into a bit of a perspective. Travel has gone from this to this. That's travel today. Let's make it a bit more interesting. It has gone to this today. So that's travel in this current century. Now, one of the perspectives of the change in travel that you would notice which is very obvious, is the cost of traveling has come down drastically. A flight from Delhi to say London back in the 80s would cost you somewhere around 10,000 US dollars, of course, that adjusted to inflation and so on and so forth. The same is available to you now with better uh, convenience, comfort, and a host of amenities right before you even step into the flight. Right? And that's below 10% of the cost that's shown you. You just have to put up with this, right? Good. And probably this. These are funny things. Where should you laugh? Right? <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of makes the conversation going, makes it easy for me. So when you see something funny, you laugh. Like, one of you laugh, then other people will laugh. Okay, that's great. So yeah, when I say a child has changed, yes. But has it changed for the better? Uh, so yes, comfort and convenience of modern travel is obviously amazing. It's, it, it saves us time and it makes it easy for us to do so. But obviously there are a few side effects which you cannot ignore. One of the things which uh, comes to my mind uh, is uh, think, just try and think of travel probably say 30 40 years back, maybe even 20 years back. If you are, if you were planning to go to an unfamiliar country or a city, it was very important that you actually brush up the, brush up the basics of the local language there. Why? You didn't have Airbnb, you didn't have Google Translate, you didn't have Google Maps. So technically, you land in Beijing and you don't know where to go because the cab driver doesn't know what you're talking about, he can't find out the hotel. 
So typically you are stuck. So that was a time when you needed to understand the basic or basics of the local language, right? The same is not true anymore. Now you can actually go to a city, have a week long vacation, actually come back without actually having to talk to a single local person. This was one very important perk of travel at the point of time, which is no longer there. And that's something which modern travel has taken away from us. So now, so I used to work for a company called Hera. Now what Hera used to do, just for the perspective was, it was, it is a platform for tours and activities across destination cities. So if you're in Singapore, you can buy tickets to USS, uh, other single sub products, so on and so forth, right? I, I have launched a lot of cities for them, say San Francisco, London, Paris, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, a lot of other cities. What we realized uh, over the years was that when business comes into travel, authenticity and uniqueness of your experience takes the back seat. Consider any major city at this point of time, say London or Paris or even New York for that matter. There are some things which are so common in all of these cities. So it's actually not surprising that you see one of these in every single city. You see a giant wheel, you see hop on hopper buses, you see Medal Resorts, you see HM, Hilton, Marriott, any other brand that you can actually associate with travel. Every single major city is actually filled with those. So there was a point of time when travel used to be authentic. This is what modern tourism looks like. And that's what we get. But again, it brings me back to the old question. Okay, I forgot about that. Anyone who has traveled abroad, a secular door, it's just a part and parcel of everything nowadays. Again, why do we travel? It's a very basic question, pretty easy question. Why do we travel, right? We travel because, in fact, I want to go out there and see something that I don't see in those nature for that matter. I come from Bangalore, so I want to go out there and see something that I probably don't get in Bangalore. I want to have an experience which I cannot have in Bangalore. But what am I getting? I can see McDonald's in Bangalore, I can actually go to New York and still go and go to McDonald's, right? Typically, it is not what travel stood for. Okay, so before we move forward, my understanding or my answer to this question was this, and I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that I would travel because I want to find something unique. I want to find a destination which provides me with ease in me features of these unique experiences and I'm sure most of you would actually relate to that. That's one side of the story. When we come to the next part of the question, that is, how do we decide whether we need to go to destination A or destination B? What makes us choose between, I want to go to London or I want to go to Paris or maybe even Mysore for that matter. How do we decide that? This is where something called DMO comes into the field. DMO basically stands for Destination Marketing Organizations. In layman terms, you can put it as ad agencies who work for travel organizations. Here's a quick video of the Just take a look. I still think before I have a date. The whole thing is that you're going to be in Look at another example. Here's an image uh, from one of the most famous beaches in Bali. This is the Kuta Beach in uh, Bali, Indonesia, right? This is 
what are the images from the marketing campaigns? Amazing, right? This is what it looks like during the week. This is a part that you don't see in marketing campaigns. And yes, it's hard to live up to marketing. When you go there, you don't generally get what the marketing images or promos or anything that shows, right? Because it's very hard to live up to that, right? Just take another example. This is whale beaching. And in any part of this image, this is synchronized whale beaching. So, this is an ad from one of the whale tour operators in Norway. You know, we consider this as one of those once in a lifetime opportunities that we need to go and see that. I don't know what happened, but sure, saw the picture, right? How amazing would it be to be on a boat and two whales probably doing whatever they were doing there? The funny part is, this probably happens once in every 50, 60,000 such stores. They won't tell you that. You would pay money, you would go there. You would probably not even see a whale. You would probably post on Instagram saying that I went for a whale. Yeah. Uh, most people would end up picking up this image. It doesn't matter whether you saw it. But if you fit, that's just like it. So yeah. Uh, that's the reality and that's the definition. Let's pick up something from our own country. How many of you remember this image? <laughs> that's incredible again. It brought a lot of Western tourists into the country. <laughs> Guess what they saw? <laughs> so that's the difference between what a DMO does and what you generally see in real life. Now, coming back to the next part, right? So most of the major and popular tourist destinations are actually getting overcrowded. And we talked about 1.2 billion people last year, and the same number to have being double in less than 10 years. Think about this. This was an image from last month, and this is the queue that people are in to get tickets to the Lulu Museum. It's just a queue to get inside the museum, right? Imagine 10 times of this. There's the Mona Lisa, and there are 100 people there trying to get a glimpse of that. If you're short, you probably couldn't get it. That's my problem. Uh, so, yeah, there are 100 people already there. Say 10 years down the line, double the number. That's essentially what's happening with major destinations. The next part that we talk about is cruise lines. This is an interesting thing about this. Uh, and for you to understand that, we need to actually, I need to take you to one of the most populated localities in the country. This is an aerial image of Tharavi slums in Mumbai. The population density here somewhere around 300,000 people per square kilometer. It's a lot of people, right? Yes? yes. Awesome. It's a lot of people. Now, it's surprising that cruises look like this. And this is the population density on a cruise. The funny part here is cruise liners have been able to convince you that you're actually getting away from all of this. Away from your overcrowded cities in search of solitude into a ship which is more crowded. And it has been selling, it actually has sold for a year and been productive for years to come. So that's called the big thing. So we talk about London, Paris, big cruise lines like Star Cruises, so on and so forth. We also have to talk about the Mauritius, Fifi Island, we talk about Bali, we talk about the smaller destinations. How do you think these guys, I would say, uh, compete with the bigger players, right? We do go to niche destinations. A lot of you would want to go to niche destinations. What attracts you? It target you on words like pick out words what you see here, unspoiled, untouched, undiscovered, pristine, these kind of words. What exactly are you trying to tell me? What does this marketing act look like? That I have a lot of unspoiled beaches. How do you even come help me spoil it? Okay, that's weird. If that is the intelligent marketing strategy that works for our tourism organizations. Why not do something like this? Visit China, through the back. And obviously, there's a start. Obviously, there's a surprise last. Right? So, yeah. Uh, okay. So, talking about tourism and how can we make sure that the destination actually continues to yield in the years to come. When I talk about popular destinations increasing the number of tourists coming in every year, there comes a point in time when overcrowding will actually 
to work towards bringing it down and it has always happened. Major distinctions have to be made because at a point, after a point in time, it's just too crowded to go there. Straightforward. Some of the things which destinations can do to safeguard themselves or to have a sustainable future, one of them is this. Promote the uniqueness. Every single destination has a story to it, be it about culture, be it about history. There's something unique about destinations because of which you actually bring them. You go to Rome because of the fact there's a story attached to it. Not because of the fact that you can see a McDonald's in, I don't know, every other corner. Not because of that, but that's essentially what's given to you. You would want to go there if you are given a story, if you are given a unique part of the experience. That's what is something that destination can do. Another thing which you can do is limit the influence. This is not something new and this is actually practiced in our country for a variety of reasons. People who have been to the Northeast would know you need an inner line permit to visit uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Might be for a different reason, but basic idea is to actually control the total number of people going in and out of that region. And the same can be employed to major destinations, right? What does it mean? At the end of the day, make sure that everyone who's visiting that city doesn't really feel overcrowded at any given point of time and can have a really good experience while they are there. And another thing that destinations themselves can do is help tourists figure out authentic experiences. Like, for instance, my interest can be different from yours. It is not necessarily I am supposed to have the same experience when I come to go make sure that you do. So, destinations in conjugation with, say, hotels or airlines can figure out what people's interests are and target them towards specific businesses who probably get into these kind of activities which are suited to their interests. Not only are you spending money in the local businesses, at the end of the day, you're also making sure every single person that comes in has a truly unique experience and not seen like everybody else.